So our speaker tonight is the B. R. Lindner Chair of Evangelical Theology at Northern Seminary, right over here in Lyle. He's married to Ray Ann, and they have one child, a son named Max. And he's pastored and participated in many church plants, including Life on the Vine Christian Community, a missional church in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And most recently, he and his family have joined Peace of Christ Church, Westmont, a church planted from Life on the Vine. He writes on the issues the local church must face in, face in mission, including cultural engagement, leadership, and theology. And his theology combines neo-anabaptist streams of thought, his commitment to evangelicalism, and his love for political theory. He has lectured and presented on these topics at many seminaries, graduate schools, denominational gatherings, and conferences. Now, Dr. Fitch is the author of numerous articles in places like Christianity Today, The Other Journal, Missiology, Evangelical Missions Quarterly, as well as other academic journals. He has been featured in places like Outreach Magazine, Anabaptist Witness, and Home Brewed Christianity. I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is the author of Faithful Presence, Seven Disciplines That Shape the Church for Mission, uh, The End of Evangelicalism, question mark, Discerning a New Faithfulness for Mission, Towards an Evangelical Political Theology, Prodigal Christianity, Ten Signposts into the Mission Frontier, the Great Giveaway, and the Great Giveaway, Reclaiming the Mission of the Church from Big Business, Parachurch Organizations, Psychotherapy, Consumer Capitalism, and Other Modern Maladies. All right, so that last one was a mouthful. Um, but I'm so excited um, for our speaker today, David Fitch. So if you would, please give him a warm welcome. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. I don't know about that intro, though. A little, a little weird. You know, all that blah, 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 blah. Okay. But anyways, uh, the main thing is I'm a pastor down the road in Westmont at a uh, church plant. I think it's my uh, seventh church plant in my life, my whole life. You're here tonight, Justin? Okay. Northern Seminary student, also a guy who runs a lot of technology, and I was teaching a class last night, and he was there too, and he was giving me problems <laughs> last night. So, anyways. So tonight I thought, um, I, I want to just talk, I just want to present three ideas to you about how we think about culture. How we think about engaging culture. How we lead churches into culture, how we lead our families, our homes, into culture. Uh, we are in extremely complex, challenging, crazy times, confusing times. Culture, you know, think about sexuality, think about racism. Think about um, uh, immigration. Think about um, other religions. In our little town, it's not that little actually, Westmont's pretty big, but in the downtown, the Westmont, or the uh, Methodist church has closed and became uh, a mosque. Actually, uh, uh, an Islam teaching center. Um, you know, uh, huge communities of Pakistani and uh, Indian immigrants south on 55th Street. That, um, I grew up in Canada, so actually that was, that was even true when I was growing up in Canada. But uh, these, these, circum these, these cultural uh, differences, I don't think my parents ever had to engage. For better or for worse, they weren't engaging. And so uh, I would like to just talk about three ideas uh, that might help. At least we can talk about it. We can ask questions about it. Okay, so this book right here, I teach culture, theology, and ethics at Northern Seminary. I tell Scott McKnight, who's the resident New Testament scholar at Northern Seminary, it's great that you teach people Bible, blah, blah, blah. I love Bible. I actually have an MA in New Testament. Scott McKnight, 
so don't try to pull anything over me. Uh, but it's not enough to know the Bible if we can't communicate, if we can't engage, if we don't understand the complexities, if we can't speak the languages. And so tonight I want us to think about how do we lead the church and culture. So this book, To Change the World, James Davison Hunter, 2010. Has anybody, by any chance, read this book? Really? Okay, that's okay. Um, Justin, you probably haven't. You haven't read the book? It's pathetic. No. Um, this book has had a profound influence on, on pastors in the United States at large as to how to think about engaging culture. So I'm just going to... I'm going to tell you a few main points from James Davison Hunter. I'm going to probably oversimplify. So this is on tape. So if James Davison Hunter's listening, I'm going to overgeneralize what you said, and, and it's probably going to overdo it. But I'm, I want the main points to come clear. And then I'm going to ask some questions about these main points. And I'm going to maybe push. I'm going to maybe go beyond James Davison Hunter. Okay? So first... Um, let me see, I just made this slide up tonight. Okay. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> what? Click on the big screen and then try to push the arrow. Why don't you come and do it? Because I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Justin Gill, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, you didn't tell me you were coming tonight. What is the, what's the deal? Okay, could you just put them all up there so we don't have to go through this again? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, okay, how culture works. How does it work? How does it change? How do we, in, how do we affect Christians, affect our culture? How do we affect the culture of Naperville, Westmont, our school systems? Well, uh, the first thing that Hunter says is that um, the focus of trying to get people saved and personal uh, renewal and revival and maybe educating people on worldview and focusing on individuals, that doesn't work. Do you all know Ravi Zacharias? Okay, that Ravi doesn't work. Ravi? If you're listening, I apologize. By the way, a little side note. Robbie Zacharias used to come over to my house and sit around my house for dinner on Sunday afternoons. We grew up in, in Canada. That's where Robbie uh, went to school, Ontario Bible College. But anyways, Robbie, you and I are friends. But James Davison Hunter says it doesn't work. Culture is so deeply embedded with habits, social practices, languages, narratives. And so it's not enough uh, to just try to convince people of ideas. We'll just scratch the surface. We'll just be talking on the conceptual level. I agree so much with James Davis and Hunter on this issue. Um, if anything has proven itself over the last 50 years, Getting individuals saved and becoming Christians so that they inhabit our culture individually does not itself change culture. So, if we think we're going to impact our culture of Naperville or Westmont or Downers Grove or Chicago or South Side or North Side of Chicago by, by just um, discipling individuals to be better Christians in the world, that's probably not going to impact culture. Um, but then James Davison Hunter responds to that by saying, culture is affected by institutions like government, schools, school systems, um, art, museums, uh, 
support systems for families. And so the way we're going to impact culture is by impacting institutions. And he says the way we are going to impact institutions is by getting the right people in charge of the institutions, which he calls elites. Okay, so I agree with uh, James Davison Hunter on the first point. I disagree with him on this point. Let me try to make my case. Well, first of all, let me just read something that James Davison Hunter says. The main reason why Christian believers today have not had the influence in our culture to which they have aspired is not that they don't believe enough or try hard enough or care enough or think Christianly enough or have the right worldview, but rather they have been absent from the arenas in which the greatest influence is exerted. Institutions. We need, he's saying... We need elites in institutions. I disagree. Okay, theologically, Jesus repeatedly lived and preached a different gospel. He said the kingdom shall, he didn't say the kingdom shall come through cultural elites. He said, the kingdom shall come among the poor, people on the margins. The last shall be first. Matthew 25, when you give a cup of water to the least of these, I was there. That was kingdom. That's where change was happening. Blessed are the poor. For theirs is the king, poor spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not the elites. He says the kingdom shall come as a mustard seed, a small little seed. It's so small, you know, what's going to happen here? And it grows into a big tree. It happens small and grows large. It's like leaven um, cultivating in a loaf of bread, the small among the big. And so, historically, time and again in history, I want to argue. No, I don't want to argue. I want to propose peacefully. <laughs> Change shall not come through the elites, but through local grassroots, incarnational presence. Incarnational means being with people talking with people, bringing people together, opening up conversations, space for God to work in these places and disrupt people and reconcile people to one another. Um, so there's a book, I highly recommend it, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, Alan Kreider. He describes how the New Testament church cultivated kingdom in the neighborhoods, on the street corners, and how over a couple hundred years the whole foundation of the Greco-Roman Empire was changed. Okay, what about this? Don, I should give you, I should give you these books uh, to put on a website or something. I can... I can uh, Don Dayton wrote a book, Discovering an Evangelical Heritage, where he describes all the holiness movements. They call them holiness movements. That would make me nervous. I'm going to go to a holiness movement. Does this mean I have to be holy? But that's not what it meant at all. It meant people were seeking after the work of God in their lives. And he shows how uh, Wesley, Charles Finney, Phoebe Palmer, the Salvation Army, the Booths, became the foundation for an abolition movement in this country, for a women's suffrage movement, for hospitals, for changing a culture. It was the people among the poor, not those rich people at Princeton Seminary. Sorry about that. Princeton's a good place, I'm sure. I've never been there, but I'm sure. If anyone's listening, I repent from the negative comment about Princeton Seminary. Okay. <laughs> What about this? Charles Marsh, 
beloved community. Now this book, if you read this book about the history of the civil rights movement, it will blow your mind. Because these things called Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee started out as Christian prayer meetings where African Americans and Caucasians, white, black, would eat together, pray together, and disrupt the Jim Crow edifices of the South in the 50s and 60s. And this became the foundation of the Civil Rights Movement, of which Martin Luther King then led what was percolating in all these little places. And so what's my point? My point is, we got to lead people to be present in their neighborhoods, in their local places, opening up space amongst all the hurt and the pain and what's going on. And by the way, if you live in Naperville, here's a little bit of news for you. There is hurt and there is pain in Naperville, even Naperville. It's just not as obvious. So, in this little book that I wrote called Faithful Presence, I, I'm offering a vision for the church that shapes us to be little house groups in the neighborhood, that prays for our neighborhood, that engages um, um, all the struggles by getting to be in places like the zoning committee, like in the coffee shops. I personally hang out in McDonald's. Coffee is pretty cheap. <laughs> free refills. About eight years ago, they got free Wi-Fi so I could do all my work. And I meet all kinds of different people that are struggling with various issues. Local, incarnational. Not elites, but local people gathered together to be present in their neighborhoods to what God's presence is doing in these places. And it takes practices. Reconciliation. That's a practice of, the, of Christians. We reconcile in the presence of Christ one with another. And we offer it to the world. Uh, table fellowship. We Christians eat better than any other people in the world. By that I don't mean the quality of the food. I mean the, the way we eat because we believe the presence of Christ is at the tables where we eat and we listen to one another, pray for one another, allow the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be flourished among us and heal one another. Um, there was something that happened in uh, my church uh, four years, three years ago, maybe. Okay, woman without a home um, we get to know she moves into the basement of one of our family's homes in Westmont. Um, some bad stuff is going on in her life. It's not able to be completely unwound. She's playing off two men in a, in a relationship. And uh, one night, she's working at 7-Eleven, one night, one of those boyfriends comes over, takes her cell phone, throws it in anger on the wall and breaks it and to compound the problem. It's all on film because the uh, counter is uh, filmed by the uh, security systems of 7-Eleven. Uh, then he goes into the basement where she lives and steals her computer. Um, so immediately some people around her, uh, and I'm, by the way, I want to be generous here and I, I realize I'm on film and I'm going to change up some of the circumstances. I, I don't want to tell all the details here. These are lives, people's lives. But, um, you know, the point was that, uh, well, we've got to call the police. And what compounded the problem was the man, the woman was a white woman, the man was a black man. And there's racial issues in our town, to say the least, to call the police on a black man in our town has ramifications. Ramification. Um, I propose we open up space instead of going to the police. Now, I understand domestic violence and all that might be in order, and so I, I understand all the discussion, but I'm just trying to illustrate something right now. 
we as Christians can actually open up space for people to be called into a space to forgive one another, love one another, reconcile, own our sin, and transform our lives. Allow Jesus to transform our lives. And that has ramifications throughout the whole community where there are racial issues in this community. So often what we want to do is we want to go to the elites. Let's go to the uh, chief of police and let's get the right man in there, a woman, and it better be a Christian, and it better be a Christian who's read James Davis in honor, and, uh, and, and so forth. We're going to solve the problems by getting the right person in charge. We're actually, I want to, I want to challenge us to think about all the ways God wants to work in these spaces of these conflicts and brokenness and reconcil unreconciled relationships and everything that's going on in our town. Yeah. And I believe, by the way, out of these times when we do this, people get saved. Because God is so real. And what he does in people's lives is so powerful that when they're invited into the kingdom, they go, yes, I want this, and I want more of this. I want Jesus. When we open up spaces in the neighborhoods, instead of trying to control from the top, this is where God breaks out in what we used to call revival. All right, so that's my first point. Um, before I go on, I know you wanted me to do this at the end, but we're going to forget about this by the time I get to the end. How culture works. What are your assumptions about the way culture works? How are you going to lead your church to engage the world for Christ and the transformation of the gospel? Do you think this is possible? Yes or no? Why or why not? Is this anything? In the words of David Letterman, is this anything? I say yes. I'm sorry? The reason I say yes is because... And who are you, by the way? My name is Rod Silva, and I go here to the Yellow Marks. Do you live... Where do you live? Here in Naperville. Uh, neighborhood. Street. Just about two blocks down the road on the right. Really? <laughs> Got to think of. I, I want to. Everyone, I want to think of when I'm talking to. I'm sorry, I already forgot your name. It's Rod. When I'm talking to Rod, I want to think about him and where he lives and the impact he's having for the gospel. So go ahead. That's why. That's what I wanted. Well, the reason I would say yes is because I believe that if we're transparent, open, and honest, as just in our ability to be able to communicate all the differences that are going on and the things that are really happening, that at that point it starts a conversation. And once you're able to carry that honesty and that openness, that, like you said, there's room in between where people start to go ahead and have a bigger impact on culture. Yeah. Yeah. I believe if uh, this woman and this man did not go to the police but instead reconciled, and then, by the way, there's like, I can't go into it now, but there's about two or three other stories that unraveled about racial incidents in our town. And so the reconciliation just unwinds to here, and then it goes to here, and then it goes to here. Pretty soon we've got a group of 20 people that recognize we have an issue in this town. Can we bring those people together? And before you know it, God works to change the world. This is our calling, to go inhabit the world for the gospel, open up space for the kingdom, and people shall be saved. Elites or local incarnational presence. In this book, I give uh, seven practices that shape people into groups to engage their neighborhoods. Reconciliation is one of those practices. Eating, eating around tables or drinking, and depending on what you're drinking, drinking moderately <laughs> around tables. 
being with the hurting, the poor. You know, the early church believed that the presence of Jesus, the risen Lord, was with the poor out of Matthew 25. So they rushed to go be with the poor, not turn them into a project, not turn the, per, the poor into my project so I feel good for all the good things I've done for people. No, go be with, share a table. So this is cultivating presence in the neighborhood. Okay, now my second point is um, about how power works. Um, Hunter defines power as inherently asymmetrical. One person has more of it than another person. And so the way a culture works is by people ex exerting force or coercion or power against another person. Hunter says power is inherent to our nature as human beings. We are all interdependent in relationships of power, and we can't escape it. Power. He says, quote, to be made in the image of God, to be charged with working and cultivating the land is to possess power. So here, here's, here's the uh, kicker. The question is not between choosing between power and no power, but how will we use the power? Okay, so, um, yeah, I just want to, I want to say that I totally disagree with that. <laughs> James, I love you, but you're all wrong on that. But, okay, okay, <laughs> let me put it this way. Um, he actually t takes a turn and he says, so he go. he, he says, you know, the problem with the political right is they were defensive and they're trying to use power to dominate and control politics. And that's not working. It's actually having a pushback. He calls that defensive. Defensive reaction. Then he talks about the political left and they're doing the exact same thing from a different agenda. But using power to dominate and control politics. I can't go into some of the more finer details here, but he says we need to quit exercising power through domination and trying to control people in politics. That's what Hunter says. Now, I, in relation to that, I agree 100%. But what I want to say, and, and to be fair to James if you're watching, is he does now make this distinction between relational power and political power. And I don't have time to go into it, um, but um, I want to agree with this idea of relational power. But in my opinion, he does not go far enough with the way God's power works. I want to suggest presence is the way God works. Presence. This is the way God manifests His power. Presence describes the way God works. And it is a very relational, non-coercive, extremely social way of power, but it's 180 degrees different. It couldn't be more opposite from the way the power works in the world. It is by God's presence that He works in the world. You know, um, if you look from the beginning of the Bible to the end, the pr presence is the dominant theme. God's presence is the dominant theme from beginning to end. You know, Garden of Eden, a guy named John Walton over at Wheaton College wrote this book, Genesis 1. And he says the Garden of Eden is constructed or described as a sanctuary for his presence. And then when Adam and Eve fall, it's God looking for them going, why have you hid from me? Why are you hiding from my presence? Presence. 
you know, and I can't go through the whole thing, but it's just an amazing, amazing. Um, <clears throat> I got a whole chapter in here on how presence dominates our understanding and of, of the way God works, you, you know, and, and I'm kind of shocked because I'm not a young man anymore like Justin is. I'm, but really, it took me till I was in my 40s to be, even to begin to understand that it's by God's presence that he changes the world. And it's by God's presence that he works in my life. And it's by God's presence that he's in the neighborhoods working. And so we know that God is at work over the whole world, you know, omnipresence. But this guy named A.W. Tozer said, yeah, he's omnipresent, but he becomes manifest presence, visible, real presence, as we make space for him to work not only in our lives, but in our neighborhoods. This faithful presence, um, you know, you think of, um, of uh, Jesus. God comes to us through sending the Son to be present with us, Emmanuel God with us. John 1.14 says he tabernacled among us, with us, his presence, right? And then, and then he says in the upper room, as the Father sent me, so send I you. He breathes on them the Holy Spirit. And he says, you extend. I mean, I'm translating now, in, theologically, of course. He, my presence goes with you. All power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Matthew 28. Thank you. I didn't do very well in my quizzing program when I was going to church. Quizzing is where we learn text, but uh, all power and authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Okay, now that's, that's about as cosmic of a statement of his authority and presence in the world as you can't, you can't escape his authority and reign. But then he says at the end, but lo, I go with you. My presence goes with you. And where you open up space for me to work, that's where I'm going to work. I'm going to reconcile people. I'm going to heal, restore people. And so it's through God's presence that he works. I think this changes everything we do as church. We go from trying to control the world to make space for God to work in the world. So when we engage culture, I'm in agreement with James Davison Hunter. Let's not go try to control the world. Let's not go try to put elites in charge. Let's not go try to dominate and control uh, everybody. Let's make space for God to work out there in all the brokenness and the hurt and the pain of our neighborhoods. Presence. Um, there was a guy, I know this guy, and he was a uh, well-known obstetrician. And I'm not going to say the city, but it wasn't Chicago. Uh, you know what? When I wrote this story up, I actually already told the city. So, Minneapolis. <laughs> and uh, there was a series of hospitals um, that had... Okay, so when you have, for, well, I mean, forgive me for talking about this as someone who doesn't know what he's talking about, but evidently crisis pregnancies with real issues, the hospitals charge ten to $12,000 per pregnancy, crisis pregnancy. A uneventful uh, pregnancy is $3,000. And what these hospitals had figured out was there's a way to make every pregnancy, a crisis pregnancy, and charge 12,000 bucks. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. The problem with it is that uh, they had priced so many people out of medical care uh, to have proper birthing medical care. And this was an injustice. So the doctor uh, went to the hospital system and they said, no, legal says we got to do this. Legal says we... Mom, mom. And so... Uh, 
instead of trying to exert his authority, he opened up space and across the street from the hospital, a house became available and he and three other doctors purchased it and made a birthing center where they could charge and easily pay for all the equipment, charge $2,500 per birth. They found out they'd get booked up seven to eight months in advance with just by starting it. Furthermore, they're right across the street from the hospital. So they had gone over and over again. He had gone and said, look, you can't do this. This is unjust. When they said, you can't do it, he opened up space for God to work. And out of that space, people just started to see the love and the grace of of a, of a doctor who cared about people and wanted to minister the gospel. Pretty soon the, do, the hospital said, hey, we'd like to call them and they'd say, we would like to buy you out. <laughs> he said, no, thank you. He said, we're planning three more of these right across the street from all the other hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> that disrupted the hospital. They had to make some changes, folks. So we... All this to say, and by the way, people get saved. You can't separate personal salvation from social salvation and what God's doing in the world. When people see racism dissolve and people come together, they go, wow, I can't believe what I just saw. Can I have some of that? Where did that come from? This is the, this is the world we live in today. And so what principalities and powers can you disrupt in your local neighborhood for the kingdom of God? Okay, where am I now on this thing? Okay, last one. What time is it? I, I, I'm, I'm going really short tonight, which is very good, trust me. Quarter, quarter you're doing good. Okay. Okay, so um, James Davison Hunter says, over against the defensive option where we're against something, he calls that the religious right. Over against the relevant to something, he calls that the uh, political left, I think he calls it. And, th and, and even against just withdrawing and staying to ourselves, he says, let's be a faithful presence within the world. Or another way to say that is, let us go and be in but not of the world, fermenting the gospel in our neighborhoods. And he calls this faithful presence. Now, central to his idea is that we need discipleship for this to happen. We've got to form people and shape people to be able to do this in the kingdom of God. We've got to form and shape people to see God at work in the world. People need a community to be shaped and encouraged and discern the ways of the incarnation. Central to his idea is that we need to be formed by a community in the practices of worship and discipleship. So this is all good. This is all good, but I want to push for more here. I think that, um, and I don't have another slide on there, I don't think, to illustrate this, so I'll just talk about it, which is always a little more boring. But I think that when we just shape individuals to send them out into the highways and byways, individuals get absorbed into the world quickly. You know, we come to church on Sunday. We hear a good sermon. We're challenged. We take a few good notes. After 52 weeks, we got about a thousand to-do lists on our thing. We haven't even gotten through the first three. <laughs> And we're sent out into the world, and we get so amped up in our jobs and our schools and managing our children's 52 sports programs that by the time next Sunday comes, we forgot everything. And I want to suggest that uh, James Davis and Hunter, if we're not careful, I mean, I like all the suggestions, but it's just going to be more of the same. 
And, and so, and, and James, if you're listening, I think you might just say, well, Fitch, there's not a whole lot of difference between what you're saying and what I'm saying, which is probably true. So let me just call it an emphasis. I think we need to cultivate church as a way of life. Not just a Sunday morning service. Um, Acts chapter 2. So I, wait, right now I'm just trying to amp up, upgrade how we define faithful presence as the answer to how we engage communities. And, and so here's one of the earliest descriptions of what the church was like, you know, the months, the years, right after Jesus ascended and became, and, and took his place at the right hand. It says, day by day, this is Acts 2.46. Notice it doesn't say just on Sundays, or it doesn't say just on Sundays in one meeting a week. It said, folks, I'm serious, day by day. Even I know what that means, and I'm not Scott McKnight. Scott McKnight is this New Testament scholar at Northern Seminary where I teach, who thinks he knows everything about the Bible. Okay. <laughs> day, day by day as they spent much time together. Together. In the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food. I should say, they broke bread from house to house and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, again, the Lord added numbers to those who were being. It was like a nonstop being saved. Okay, so they were in the neighborhood. So look, there were three spaces here. The temple, which is the very center of the presence of God for, the, for Israel and for Jerusalem. And by the way, Paul calls what the temple? 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 3, and other places. The church becomes the fullness, the temple, the place of his presence in the neighborhoods. But they didn't just stay in the temple. They ate their food. Remember I said eating was a big deal for the uh, first church, practicing eating food. Eating. We all eat anyways. Why don't we do it from house to house in the neighborhoods, praying for our neighbors? They ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And then it says they had the goodwill, or they were connected with all the people in the neighborhoods. At our church, in this book, I call it the three circles. The close circle. The intense close, not closed, close, where everyone is committed to submitting to Christ's presence and knowing his presence. Let's say on Sunday morning, that's when it happens in my church. You probably have a Sunday morning, but you, I hear you have other gatherings like that on other times. Close circle. Dotted circle is the discipleship from house to house. Dot, I call it a dotted circle because it's still Christians, but, but non-Christians can see what's going on as you cultivate that presence in the neighborhood. And by the way, it only takes, in my house, it happens uh, two and a half hours from 5 to 7.30 every Sunday night. It's, it's not another program because we all eat anyways. We have to stop eating. We, we no, I, I almost said we have to stop eating so much, but that's not what I meant. We, we can't stop. We're not going to stop eating. Let's just do it together and practice the table in the neighborhoods. And then lastly, the half circle is where we go and be present as guests amongst the lost and the hurting. And we allow space to be open for his presence. It's a whole way of life, not just sending individuals out to go do good deeds in the world. So these are three ideas um, that I think are really, really important. I could, I could summarize it with three Ps. Practices, presence, places. Every good sermon has alliteration. Three Ps. That's my challenge to you as you learn how to lead churches into engagement with culture. Um, shape a group in a neighborhood via the practices of the gospel. Reconciliation, eating, being with the least of these. 
know that it's by God's presence that he works, not by our own energy. It's just so releasing when I can just go and be present to what God's doing in people's lives and not feel the pressure that I have to do something. And then lastly, places. We need to cultivate the gospel. We need to cultivate presence. Not only on Sunday morning, but in our homes and the neighborhoods and in the half circles of the broken and the hurting. And they all work together as one whole way of life. All right, so that's, uh, that's it. Wait, did I have anything? Did I have any? Uh, no, that's boring. That's boring. Boring. That's my new book coming out in July. The Church of Us versus Them. Sorry, cheap advertisement. No, boring, 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 boring. Okay, let's just shut this thing down. Okay. Any questions, any ideas, any, uh, is this possible? Maybe you're already doing this and I've just been talking and you're all going, duh. <laughs> okay, we have a question there and then a question there, yes. Half circle. Yeah, I call it a half circle because, okay, so the circle represents Christians, the line in the circle. Close circle means, uh, uh, hold on one second, hold on, I can, I, can, I can do better than this. Justin, be ready. This could go really wrong fast. Sorry, we couldn't find the... <laughs> okay. Nope, it's not going to work. Is there some place I can write on? No, yeah, okay. There's a whiteboard on the wall over there. There is? Yeah, but everyone's going to have to turn around, eh? <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Okay, so think, think of a circle. It's, 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 it's a tight circle. It's, it's a closed circle. It's not closed, but everybody is submitted to Christ, discerning the table, let's say. On Sunday morning, um, we, I don't know what you do with your Lord's table here, but at our church, if you are a faithful follower of Christ and you have no enmity or enemies in the room, if you do, go and reconcile. Come and discern the table. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle, he says, he says uh, you, some of you are getting sick and dying because you don't discern the table or examine yourselves. Because our relationship with God is not right around the table. It's not in proper surrender and submission to Him. So the close circle is a discerning circle. When we go into the neighborhood, it's dotted because it's still Christians and we're still discerning His presence, but non-Christians can see and come in and look. It's more, the, the feeding of the 5,000 is a good example of this for me. The half circle is we go into all these places and now we are a guest. Think of Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends the disciples, his first missionaries out. And he says, go and uh, sit at this table and eat what's set before you. You are not in charge. Um, go as sheep among wolves, humble, vulnerable. Um, go without a purse. You are a guest. You're not paying for anything. You're not exerting power. And so, and then, by the way, Jesus says, and then proclaim the gospel. And then he says, those who hear you, hear me. I'm there, present. So the question is not whether Jesus is present. It's whether he's going to be recognized. So it's a totally different dynamic. I call it the half circle. Because it's a Christian sitting with someone who is not yet a Christian or is not yet submitted to Jesus as Lord, who is struggling. Half circle. And, of course, we hope that it becomes a completed circle when that person comes into the kingdom. Those are the dynamics, I think, of the way a church cultivates the three spaces of life. There's another question here, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you talked a lot about how um, we and Christians in general can change culture. Um, my question would be, um, if you think that the culture is what we should focus on, 
um, and the fears why. And because to me, teams like when we look at the views, we always most focus on the one. But he never, his goal was never to change the society, but he always told people focus on the one. And people oftentimes land the pitfall of trying to um, change a big thing when they should have focused on something little. So would you say that change in the culture is our goal, or is it only the result of, for example, focusing on the one? Okay, well, uh, the dichotomy kind of throws me off there. Uh, the uh, dichotomy, is Jesus trying to change the, the little or the one or culture? Uh, or um, um, is he, I think the way you said it was, it, is he focusing on the one and culture is an after effect? And, okay, so, so for me, uh, what is striking about um, the incarnation, that God came into the world. And, no, and, and Alan Hurst says no one even knew he was there for 30 years. Um, you know what I'm saying? In other words, God is here, and we don't know it. Remember, uh, uh, that's going to sidetrack me. I'm getting better at listening to the Holy Spirit. I was going to give you another example of that. <laughs> don't go there, Dave. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but, um, no, the point is that God comes into a culture to learn a culture so as to be able to communicate in that culture. It's actually not possible to communicate in a culture without being in the culture. So we have to engage. And so, so it's almost impossible for me to work on the one without working on the whole. Um, what, I, what I want to talk about, you know, when Jesus was in the uh, temple uh, disrupting the tables... He was disrupting, what he was doing was he was disrupting the culture of Israel who had thought they had a, um, they had a um, priority with God that the rest of the world didn't have. They had posture. And so he was disrupting the culture. Jesus did these little things all the time, but he did them in such subtle ways. You remember what he, remember Jesus talking about I have come not to bring peace, but the sword. The Father shall hate the Son. The Father shall hate the Father. Everyone's going to hate everybody. Actually, okay, so the sword. Okay. I don't hear this tomorrow morning from McKnight, okay? So this is, I think this is, the sword is not a weapon of violence. The sword in Scripture is the Word of God the persuasive word of God. And just by his presence, he disrupts the ideologies and the cultures. And out of that, people come to him. I say it like this. Jesus never makes enemies. He reveals them. And you get revealed. And you have a choice. Am I going to confess and repent and come? Or am I going to um, defend myself over against Jesus. And so, all, all that to say in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, unsophisticated way is I can't separate Jesus dealing with the one without Jesus dealing with the culture. That it's actually, like, like I can't separate um, those two people who are caught up in the racial violence of Westmont without dealing with, without calling to, re revealing the racial violence going on in that exchange because it reveals oh I need God I got I need forgiveness I need reconciliation and uh, this is where the gospel not only not only changes culture but it always changes individual lives as well yes sir Three different groups that I hang out with, right? So I have my small group, which is very much focusing on church, following Jesus, things like that. Um, I have a group of friends that I have dinner with every Thursday night, um, where I'm the only Christian in that group. And then I have another group of friends that I um, go to sporting events with, and most of them are probably the most vulgar people I've ever met in my life. Well, what kind of sporting events? Uh, the Bears games. Bears games? Yeah. Oh. So, okay. Um, so, uh, I guess what I struggle with is 
you know, I look at the new, I look at the book of Acts, right? And so in, in the book of Acts, you see Pentecost happen. The Holy Spirit comes on the disciples and they have the power to go be God's witness in, you know, Jerusalem today as we get to here. Um, and when I read it, what I see from them is that they don't ever stop talking about Jesus. They don't ever stop um, talking about the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, things like that. And this I, is where now again? What? This is this is in Acts or what are you talking? In talk? Acts, right after Pentecost, right? Um, so when you see Paul's journeys, he goes like throughout with uh, Silas and Peter, and you know, preaching the gospel and, and all these kind of things. And I, I just kind of struggle because I, I think to myself like when I'm with these my friends who I have dinner with on Thursday nights, um, I'm not always necessarily preaching the, the gospel with my mouth. I'm not always telling them about Jesus. Um, I've actually been asked by some of them, please don't ever talk to me about Jesus. Um, when I go to the, the football games, uh, you know, I feel like a, a lot of the people there are, are older white men who can be really vulgar sometimes, and it's kind of like... Older white guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Older white guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Older white guys tend to have yeah. certain leanings that um, you know I don't necessarily always agree with. Uh, do they watch this on film, by the way? Do they, do they, do they watch this? I mean, I'd be happy if they did. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, that, would, that would be a step forward, I think, for a lot of them in their faith. Um, but I just wonder, like, what is our... So I, I hear you kind of talking about opening up the space, engaging the culture and things like that. But at what point, like, how do we actually start making that impact with our, with our voice, or, you know, is that what we're called to do, and how does that actually work in those situations? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, the second point I made was the distinction between the way the world, the power of the world works, and the presence of God, His power works. I just think that's so important. And it changes the way we engage everybody. We go now into the world assuming God's at work in people's lives. We go there to discern God's presence at work, not only in them, but around them. Now, when Paul healed that guy, was it Acts 4? Justin? <laughs> the temptation is to view all of Acts as these instantaneous, he's walking around, one miracle happened. Actually, Paul spent between one, 18 months and two and three years at a stop. He went to the synagogues first, where people already knew the story. He became present in these places. Uh, one of the places where he didn't do that, Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17, was a disaster. They ran out of town. I mean, okay, I think there are three people saved, and they were all Gentile God-fearers. The rest of them thought he was a cuckoo. Okay, so um, presence is how God works. So I have this bar I go to. I don't want to tell you which one because I don't want you showing up there, okay? Just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm there one Wednesday night and one of my students shows up because I talked about the bar. I'm like, well, what are you doing here? Okay, but anyways, it's okay. I go there and I pray what the Catholic priests call the epiclesis, before the bread and the cup, you know, invoking the Spirit to make Jesus' presence real in this bread and cup. Although I'm now talking this bar, beer, people. Lord, make yourself known in this place. And then I go and I wait. I wait. Sometimes I'm waiting there going, what? Lord, you're wasting my time here. God of the universe, I've got things to do, you know. But the other night I'm there, and I'm going, oh, Lord, I'm, 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 I say, be present, Lord. Help me to be present to your presence. This is the Eucharistic prayer. I turn around, and Brad asked me to play pool. Brad, I've been there one year. Brad's never asked me to play pool. No one's asked me to play pool. I stink at pool. But if you are asked to play pool in this bar, you are now in. 
I want him to start crying in the bar, but that just would have been so bad. Okay? Um, so I go, I go to Brad, look, I stink at pool. He goes, it's okay. I go, oh, wow. Okay, presence is happening. A relationship is building. And, and then <laughs> this couple that we're playing pool with, kingdom breaks out. Okay, this is what it looked like. She got into a terrible fight with this guy she was with. She started saying things like, you do not deserve me! She's, I mean, real violence is starting to break. She takes the pool cue and she throws it on the pool table. Brad looks at me, whoa. All the balls start flying everywhere. Brad says, I gotta get out of here. I go, me too. So he goes to the front door and he takes, takes that uh, steam thing that he smokes. Vape thing. <laughs> I light up one of my, uh, I was in Europe a couple times uh, this summer and I had these uh, moods, uh, really, cigarillos, they're unbelievable. <laughs> and, and, their, and their space starts opening up for the gospel. We start talking about the struggles of relationships. And then that couple, by the way, the guy comes back on and says, look, we're really sorry. Can we, can we play pool again? Okay, now all this to say, I, I, maybe, maybe this is, you're asking, why are you telling this ridiculous story? I don't, nobody gets, nobody got saved. This is how God works. He, when violence breaks out in the bar, that's where God's working for reconciliation. Truth just broke out. Now am I going to be present and ready to proclaim the gospel when, when he starts pouring out his life to me. I've seen it happen again and again and again if I will wait long enough. I was at the bar about six months ago and this guy named Mike. Mike, if you're listening, sorry to throw you under the bus. Okay, <laughs> Mike, Mike comes, sits at the bar, we're having a beer, and Mike starts shaking his right leg like he's nervous at the bar. And uh, he says, okay, now what do we do? I go, what are you talking about? Well, when do we make our move? What are you talking about? I, you know, do you have a tract in your, the back of your pocket? No, we wait patiently, praying presence. We, the pressure's off. Sometimes it can be boring, but pressure's off. And, and sometimes I'm there and absolutely nothing happens. But people saw me I'm there, they know me, this too shall, kingdom, kingdom shall come from this. This is the kind of work we're called to. Alan Kreider, patient ferment of the early church. And when they start pouring out their lives to you, the Spirit will give you the words for the gospel. Jesus is Lord, he's working in your life. Are you interested? I can see where he's taking you, and I just believe he's doing this. Are you interested? Yes. Well, then let's go. I think I've overspent my time here. I mean, is, is it 9 o'clock yet? <laughs> no, it's, it's 10 after 8. I think we, could have, we have some time for a couple more questions. Yes. Uh, name again one more time. Rod. Rod. Yes, yes, yes. Organization. I want to go talk to big churches like uh, Yellow Box. Is, is, this is the name of the church, Yellow Box. Community, community Christian, but we go. Yellow on. Box Community Christian. Mm -hmm. yep. Are you aware that the word? Are you aware that the color yellow is the color for cowardice? I, I mean, <laughs> Okay, anyways, I'm not, <laughs> okay, I'm just having a little fun with you, sorry. Uh, I probably will not be invited back, okay. Uh, <laughs> but um, when I go talk to big churches, uh, I, I, I talk about how do we go from programs to presence? How do we do less in here? And let this be a training ground for like what you're doing now to train people to be out there. 
you know, how do we take the basketball league and the basketball court and people, 10 great basketball coaches spending all their time in here, and why don't we send two basketball coaches at a time to the YMCA, to the park district, to all the places where people are hurting to go and be present as their half circle. Spend enough time with the kids and kingdom will break out because God's working there. Um, so, yeah, uh, but those, the, the second, second big hurdle is uh, really I think, uh, I think we've lost, in the United States, I think we've lost the wherewithal to make space for his presence. I think, I think we've architected God's presence out of our lives. I think we're so busy, we're so crazy. I mean, if I lose 20% on my, on my uh, what, do you call, uh, what do you call the retirement account thing? 401k. If I lose 20% on my 401k, I'm, I'm down on my knee. Oh God, I'm not gonna survive. One more day. Meanwhile, there's hurting people all around. I'm obsessing around about my 401k. On the computer. Okay. Okay. We have arched. We're more God. Our 401ks have taken the place of God. All I'm trying to say is, us all the ways our minds, our bodies, our our habits are formed to not have to depend upon God for anything. And we don't open up space for his presence to work. Instead, we want to take control. We want to be in control. And uh, Jesus in Matthew, and I can't remember the chapter and verse. Why'd you just raise your hand when I said I can't remember the chapter and verse? I was going to ask you a question. Oh. Je <laughs> Jesus, remember in Matthew somewhere, he's leaving. <laughs> He's leaving Palatine and he says, I cannot do any miracles here. They have no faith. In other words, they have no trust. They haven't opened up space to submit and make, make space for me to work. Instead, we're just so busy. And this is, this is a huge inertia of the church today. So I've learned is as we gather around the table and we slow things down and we start encountering each other in our our lives every Sunday night and then and then we grow to trust one another and we grow to tend to the presence of what he's doing there all of a sudden we start the real truth comes out people's deep hurts and pains somebody has to go to the hospital some kids in trouble somebody's finances are falling apart all of a sudden we gather around we unwind the stuff going on, the antagonisms, the, the, the unforgiven sin, the, the broken relationships, the, the brokenness inside, the healing that's needed, and, and things start bursting out and miracles start to happen. I know I sound crazy right now. I know I sound charismatic, but this is what happens, and this should be the norm for the Christian life. But we need to make space for it, folks. And uh, these practices that I'm talking about... Uh, do that. He's given us practices to do this. Okay, was there another question besides Justin? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm uh, very uh, energized by what you're talking about. How in your local church are you impacting believers to try to move into this kind of rhythm. Okay, I don't know what, what you mean by impacting, but it's a slow cultivation process. Because uh, we, we started, a, we meaning my wife and I, with 10 other people started a church in the northwest suburbs. And then through a lot of circumstances, we sent about 25 people to move into Westmont and it's a slow, and so now I'm pastor with about four other pastors, very slow process. It's a process of cultivating fellowship around a table once a week. I tell people, um, first time I did this, I had to go through 42 people to find 10 who would have uh, dinner with me and my wife around a table. It took me over a year. 
emails. Okay, I've got to go to a U2 concert. I have to go to a movie. I haven't seen my family this whole week. I need to spend time with my family, I understand. I have to get my kids to three new programs that just started this week or else they won't make it to Harvard. <laughs> Harvard? The most godforsaken institution in the nation? <laughs> okay, fine, go. I had to go through 42 people. 42. I would say things like, look, I'm an old white guy. I, am, I need friends. <laughs> okay, finally got 10 people. There's a lot of inertia to overcome. And then we'd have to sit around the table. We'd, what we do is we join hands and we say the Eucharistic prayer. Oh, God, thank you for the provision of life and food. As the Eucharist means Thanksgiving in Catholic terms, Catholic Latin or whatever that is. And then we'd say, Lord, be present. Help us to tend to your presence around the table. For your kingdom, amen. And then we'd all sit around. There was, about, there was 10 adults and about 8 kids. We would have to slowly cultivate the presence of Christ. Like I would be the leader. And uh, one of the things we decided very quickly, no cell phones. Please, no cell phones. Cell phones, leave them, get a little basket. Put them. Uh, cell phones. Cell phones have architected God out of our existence. So just get rid of the cell For three hours, please, let's get rid of the cell phones. Okay, and then, and then if some guy starts to talk too much about himself, you know, first of all, they'd notice Fitch is not talking all about himself. You know, you know, type A people, they want to talk about themselves. They want to draw all the attention to themselves. This is totally against the presence of God. Take your attention off yourself cast it onto somebody else and what God's doing here. So I'd have to say, John, John, you're talking. I, I wouldn't say you're talking too much. Why don't you ask Judy a question? <laughs> Cultivate presence. <laughs> Over time, we grow to love each other. There was a guy, I won't, there was a guy who uh, literally, when I first met him, smoked pot from the moment he got up to the time he went to bed. He couldn't hold a job, didn't want to come to church. Him and his wife were on the verge of separation. And he came. And over like a year, no more pot, got a job, marriage healed. One night, because after, after the first hour of eating together and just checking in with each other, uh, by the beginning of the second hour, uh, I would ask a question. Uh, it would be an up, in, or out question, an up question about our relationship with God, a in question about us together, an out question about the neighborhood. And then I, that night I asked, why do you come here? And this guy said, this is the most important three hours of the week. For the first time in my life, I am known and loved, and I know people, I really know people. This is the space that God's going to work to heal the world. Then after about, you know, and then always at the end of the night for half an hour, we gather in the living room and pray for all the things we've heard in the neighborhood. We open up space for God to work through prayer in our lives and in the neighborhood. That took a year to cultivate. After we got 10 people, it took another year to cultivate that trust. But afterwards, I cannot live now. When we moved to Westmont, Rianne had this big table she got at some junk shop. It stayed in the corner because we bought a foreclosed house that had a lot of problems. And I was miserable for six months till we got that table up and was forming table fellowship because it fed my soul so much as well as impacted the neighborhood. These things take cultivation. I can give you a little stories, a little tips on how to cultivate house fellowships. And I can give you tips on how to, but, but, but you know, um, <clears throat> we developed our own systems. By the way, it's all in this book. Did I say I have about, <laughs> I have about 10 of these for cost, 10 bucks uh, cash though, and I'm not selling them for profit. So I'm not, I'm not doing anything illegal, okay? 10 bucks cash is my cost. To so, if you're interested. All right, well, it's been great being with you all tonight. Uh, Justin, okay, folks, I submit to you, Justin. You had a question. I blew you off.
This will have to be the last question. Make it quick. What's that? I was, I was just going to ask you, a lot of time we think that by converting people that are elites that become Christian, um, I think we innately know that becoming Christian requires a lot of sacrifice. And as a person, knowing your bio a little bit, that has crossed from elite to sacrifice to create a faithful presence in local communities and stuff, could you give a slight bio of yourself and tell us why you think that it's important to transition to give up that kind of power. Why is it worth it in the Christian life? <laughs> Someone was asking me about my financial career before uh, I became a professor. And uh, I said, I'm a union guy. They go, you were in the financial services business. I go, but I built that whole business around union pension funds, and I spent all my time with union people. That's why I'm a White Sox fan, <laughs> not a Cub fan. <laughs> um, that's a thick question. Uh, I'll just say this. Um, um, we have to uh, be very careful about status in the world and what it does to us. And we have to always be willing to give it up for the kingdom of God, for his calling on our lives. Um, and almost always, if we are living uh, the kingdom, we are disrupting the, uh, the ways money, influence, principalities, and powers take over people's lives. I don't believe everybody who is in financial services is called to be a church planter like me, like I was 20 years ago or whatever it was, 25 years ago. <clears throat> but I do believe we're all called to lay it on the altar for the kingdom of God. All right, so that, but it's, it's, there, there's a lot more to say on that, and we're out of time. Thank goodness. <laughs> I pray the Lord bless you guys.